Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about the importance of using prescription and over-the-counter medications properly. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Timothy Condon, Deputy Director, National Institute on Drug Abuse, National Institutes of Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Barbara Krantz, Chief Executive Officer and Medical Director, Hanley Center, West Palm Beach, Florida. Beverly Gimrick, Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Program Coordinator, Peer Assistance Services Incorporated, Denver, Colorado. Dr. Clark, how prevalent is prescription drug misuse in the United States? Well, we estimate that there are approximately 15 million people who misuse prescription drugs in the United States, and that gives us an estimated 2.5 million new initiates per year, or if you think about it, that's about 7,000 new initiates a day. And within that, um, do one age group uses it more than others? What is, what is the distribution among the age groups? Well, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that prescription drug abuse affects uh, the entire age range. We might see uh, some peak use in the 18 to 25 year olds, but uh, it is a problem that confronts every age range and what we shouldn't do is to simply dismiss it as a, a young adult or a teenage phenomenon. In fact, uh, it's a problem that affects every age range. Mm. Dr. Krantz, where do most of the non-medical users of prescription drugs uh, get their drugs? The mo most of the time, non-medical users of prescription drugs um, receive their drugs from friends or their medicine cabinet, their mother's medicine cabinet. Um, from leftover medication, um, and those that do take it from the medicine cabinet or get it from a friend or a relative, um, the statistics, I believe, actually show that they're getting it from, receiving it from one physician, one doctor that's actually prescribing it. Dr. Condon, what types of drugs are, are we talking about? Well, we've got a number of different classes, and we're always finding something new that people are abusing, but uh, generally we have uh, CNS, or central nervous system depressants, tranquilizers, sedatives, that sort of thing. Stimulants, very big uh, prescription drug abuse, often used now, and we've got a growing problem as cognitive enhancers, performance enhancers, mm -hmm. and uh, opiate analgesics, widely prescribed for the control of pain, appropriately so in many cases, but we see that that's a source for a lot of the misuse or abused prescription opiates. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, what are the short and long-term effects of the misuse of prescription drugs? You have to keep in mind that people take these uh, medications for effect. So if you take a prescription pain reliever, you are experiencing some euphoria. If you take a sedative, you are experiencing some tranquilized effect. But a lot of this is complicated by the fact that people mix these medications when they're not designed to be mixed. They add alcohol to these medications, and that's not designed, that's not a designated purpose. So when you're looking for the short-term effects, while you may be trying to get high or uh, euphoric, you may wind up uh, uh, having a short-term effect called death because uh, people uh, often overdose on these medications because they underestimate the power f of the medications. They are prescribed by the physician to the designated patient for the condition that the designated patient presents with when they see the, pa the physician. They're not prescribed for somebody else and so uh, nor are they prescribed to, uh, to have a party and, and we occasionally have people who overdose and we're seeing that a lot with prescription opiates. Uh, people uh, overdose because they underestimate the power of the medication. Are most of the overdoses uh, when is when the medication is misused or is improperly taken while it is prescribed? Or both? 
Well, if it's improperly taken when it's prescribed, that's misuse. So the idea is mostly overdose deaths are associated with uh, non-therapeutic purposes or non-therapeutic uh, procedures. So uh, that's the key issue that a uh, person is either augmenting when they shouldn't be or they're taking something that was never designed for them in the, or designated for them in the first place. So one of the reasons we get the message out is because in some jurisdiction, if you give somebody a pill that they uh, overdose on it, even if they add alcohol or something else, you're, you're held criminally liable. So not only are you, you contribute to somebody else's uh, death, or hospitalization, you can be held criminally liable. I think that's a really important point that most people don't understand, is we know a lot of adults share their medications out there, and they don't <laughs> understand there can be legal repercussions from that, not to mention the, the physical. I mean, that's something that people are not aware of. This can be deadly, and not only is it deadly, it can be just as illegal as sharing uh, illicit medications as well. So, and, and that's a point that the general public doesn't seem to understand very well. That, that brings me to another point because the, when we treat older adults in, in our facility and the problem is when the client comes in, the patient comes in, they're probably on about four to five different prescription medications. So the drug-drug interaction of the prescription medications and they may be seeing different um, specialists, like they're seeing a cardiologist, a urologist, a family practitioner, none of them are, are talking to each other. So the drug-drug interactions and the potential for um, the morbidity or, or mortality that Dr. Clark was talking about is extremely high. Um, you know, just because it's a prescription drug doesn't mean that it's a safe drug. Um, and, and I think we're you know, you add over-the-counter medications and other medicines or herbal medications to that, um, and we're seeing a very serious problem with prescription drug abuse. Didn't One of uh, the things also um, that just was touched upon is that um, individuals at different age groups, and we know this from the uh, from pharmacology, they metabolize the drugs, uh, medications, drugs differently. And uh, a dose that was tested in a young adult, let's say, uh, for a particular purpose may not be metabolized the same way by an elderly person. In fact, it's unlikely that it is. So the same dose may have and uh, a very different effect, and that's where this combination or drug-drug interaction actually comes in, and oftentimes we do see, unfortunately, the headlines when it's somebody who's a star or a celebrity, but uh, that's where a lot of this is coming. I recall that um, a few years back, I, I would say around four or five years ago, at Seaside we did do the right dose for the uh, 65 and over. We had two. We had the 50 to 65 because we thought that they would not identify with a picture of an older uh, adult. And then we did the 65 and over, and we worked with FDA. And in one particular thing that you said, Dr. Krantz, was the use and the mixing of it with alcohol, which is absolutely uh, tragic. Right. And I think that, the, think that brings us back to it's extremely important to educate the patient, to educate the physicians, and to educate the patients. Uh, regarding the the use of the medication, um, and I think with prescription drug medications, like Dr. Condon was saying, also is that as as people age, the normal physiological changes that occur with aging, um, the drug itself, because there's a, a volume distribution, um, the drug itself has more impact on the body. So that needs to be taken into consideration also, um, as far as education. Yeah. I think one of the things that we also want to establish here is that um, prescription drugs, if taken properly, are beneficial. You know, I, I, I think, um, uh, it, it, but that really leads to the fact that, uh, that they can see the benefit. Why might people believe then that prescription drugs uh, are not dangerous or, or addictive? Well, I think there's a myth. If it's good for Dr. Condon, then it's good for me. And uh, so he takes it, then, gee, well, I can take it. Uh, but Dr. Condon would have had it uh, prescribed by a physician for the purpose of for the designated purpose. I know they don't have that issue, so I take it, and boom, I get uh, an overdose. 
uh, or somebody else has taken the medication for a period of time and uh, they take that dose and nothing happens. I take the same dose and boom, I'm out. Uh, we also have to keep in mind driving while under the influence. Uh, I take that dose and the next thing I know I'm woozy, I get behind the wheel of a car and I hurt somebody, uh, if not just myself. So the key issue is the other person for whom it's designated doesn't have that experience and so they, you know, it's safe for them. Uh, I can bring that to a personal level also um, with prescription um, medication is that back in 1981 I had migraine headaches and was prescribed a narcotic, an opiate, uh, specifically Demerol, and started taking the medication and as you continue potentially, if as you continue taking the medication when we look at the disease of addiction, um, there's a progression. It's a chronic disease. We go from use to abuse to dependence. So then as I started taking more of the medication, I actually became dependent on a prescription drug. So for me, it wasn't safe anymore. And quite honestly, I didn't understand what was going on. I knew that there was a problem. I knew that I was in trouble, but I didn't understand. When we come back, I want to come back to you, Dr. Krantz, to talk a little bit more about this. And then we're going to talk about another set of medications, which are over-the-counter medications, which are also uh, uh, on the rise in terms of its misuse. We'll be right back. It's important for us to realize that roughly 70% of individuals who misuse prescription drugs get those uh, prescription drugs from friends and family. 55% get them free from friends and family. Another 15% either buy them from friends and family or steal them from friends and family. So the key issue is that what we have to do is influence uh, our communities. It's a cultural issue. I influence our communities to get people to understand that once you're finished with a prescription drug or if you need the prescription drug on an ongoing basis, you do not share them with individuals for whom the prescription was not written. When you have a drug or alcohol problem, your whole world stops making sense. You can get help for yourself or a loved one and make sense of life again. For information, treatment referral, and most importantly, help. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. People who suffer from drug or alcohol addiction sometimes say hurtful things. They drive the people who love them most away. If you know someone who suffers from drug or alcohol addiction, listen. Try to hear what they are really saying. Know that there is hope and help them find their voice again. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Having first-hand knowledge, personal experience with the disease of addiction, uh, it has been extremely helpful in my treatment of patients. You know, patients come in scared, uh, a lot of shame, um, and when they're going through even initially the withdrawal process, they may say to me, you know, you just don't understand how I feel. And that gives me a great opportunity to tell them, not only do I know how they feel, um, I have the personal experience as well as the book knowledge to, to help them, and there is help. Dr. Crunchy, we're talking about your own experience with a, a, a very um, potent uh, medication. Did you have a sense of, of, of a perception of safety while using it? Well, the, the, the drug itself used properly is a, is a safe drug and an effective drug. 
um, what happened to me was um, I increased the frequency of using the drug and the, the amount that I used. And then because of the biochemical genetic trait that I wasn't aware of, actually became dependent on the drug. So prescription drugs certainly are safe if used and, and effective uh, if used as prescribed. Um, That's assuming that everybody's going to follow the physician's uh, directive, correct, Beverly? That's correct. And, and I think we have to take a look at the prevalence of prescriptions in today's society and how that's changed among the public perception. With the direct-to-consumer marketing and advertising over the last 10 to 12 years, we're seeing more prescriptions out there and they're treating more conditions and that's fabulous and we need to use those as directed and as safely as possible. But in that same refrain, we've taken medications that we used to maybe have a lot of respect for and treat them you know, as something to, to be respected, and we've made them commonplace uh, among our youth. And, you know, $4 medications, while those are fabulous, those ads are making this just as easy to do as a, a soda that you get in the drugstore in 7-Eleven. For instance, my uh, daughter, when I put her to bed, my four-year-old, a couple of years ago, looked at me and said, when is the night-night butterfly going to come? Mm -hmm. And that's from seeing the Lunesta commercial that was quite popular at that point in time. So we've changed the way we think about medications with the marketing and advertising and given them more of an assumption to be safe than they were many years ago. So I think that's something to think about as we're, we're discussing And what this. does a parent say to the child when that occurs? Well, you know, as a parent, it's very difficult because you give your child medication and say, here, this will make you feel better. And, and that, again, is giving a mixed message to, to our children and to our youth that taking a medication is always going to make them feel better. And we need to explain to them that taking a medication is there for a specific purpose, a specific reason to treat a specific condition in their body in order for, to make those germs or, you know, go away so that then they will feel better. So it's changing the perception in the way we're talking. Dr. Condon, um as Beverly was mentioning, um, they're, they're, uh, not only the advertising, but some of the young children and young adults and youth also get a lot of uh, medications, very, very potent medications. And in what instances uh, might, they, might they face uh, an encounter with these? Well, overall in the country, uh, we are seeing, have seen for the last couple of decades, a dramatic increase in prescriptions for controlled substances, stimulants and opiate analgesics and uh, CNS depressants. And so we, do, we have had this whole culture change. I agree very much that uh, we treat medications differently and that has a double-edged sword. It's good and bad that people are not afraid to take medications that can be life-saving. At the same time, uh, are we sending the wrong message? So um, with the increase in prescriptions that we've seen. Uh, young people, for example, we see more prescriptions for opiate analgesics uh, related to dental care for young people. And um, that's their first experience usually with an opiate analgesic when they have some kind of root canal or extraction, usually with third molar extraction procedures. Um, also, stimulants uh, are a big issue uh, for appropriately uh, prescribed for attention deficit disorder, but uh, we're probably over-prescribing in the country for ADHD because they're, all children are not being appropriately diagnosed with real ADHD, where these medications can be very, very helpful. Dr. Clark. We also have the notion of the sharing. I mean, the earlier point made uh, by Dr. Krantz in terms of people sharing the medication, and the, you get the drugs from friends or family. There's a cultural thing that somehow sharing your medication is permissible, uh, even though the person who's getting the medication is not using it for a therapeutic purpose. 
uh, when you add the number of people who get it free from friends and family plus the ones they, who take it from the medicine cabinet or who buy it from friends and family, it's 70 percent. So we, we are talking here a cultural phenomenon. I mean, we know about the Internet. It turns out there are minority people who get their drugs from the Internet. We know about drug dealers. It turns out a minority of the people get their drugs from drug dealers. We know about doctors who are uh, not acting in, in, in good form, uh, but a minority of people get their drugs from those. So in the aggregate, only 30 percent of the misuse of prescription drugs comes from, shall we say, deviant situations. With 70 percent comes from friends and family. So part of the message is that the community has to be actively involved in discouraging the misuse of these medications because it is a community value and a community norms and a community message. And if we don't deal with that, then we essentially encourage people to misuse prescription drugs with the mythology that it's safe even though the medication is only safe and effective for the intended use or the intended person. Mm. And Beverly, what is the message to the youth in terms of a pre from a prevention perspective? I think we need to let them know that medications can only be used as prescribed for that specific individual and that it is something not to be abused and not to be mistreated. I think to our adults and to the parents and to the grandparents out there, we need to let them know that they need to take their medications and their prescriptions and treat them as they would their cash, their credit cards, and put them in a safe location and so that they're, they're not something to be shared, just the way we don't share our Social Security number. I also think, I want to go back to, to your point about the, the dental pain and the, the dentist. We, we talk a lot about our medications. If, um, if you have a 16-year-old that goes to the dentist to have the wisdom teeth pulled, when they go to school the next day, their friends go, so what drugs did you get? You know, uh, we need to learn that we don't need to talk about what pain medications we're taking or what medications we're taking with anyone other than our pharmacist and our physician. We don't need to share that information. I was at a health fair recently, and I had a seventh grader come up and we were discussing different medications, and she said, oh, my dad just had surgery. He's got Vicodin. Well, she just informed all of her, her peers around her that there was Vicodin in her home, you know, which yeah. then allows her to go, you know, then share them. So, um, then she had a lot of friends come that, over that's her house. Right. A lot of BFFs. That's right. That's right. But there was no reason that seventh grader needed to know her dad was taking that specific medication. You know, and it's just, it's, they've become such a casual thing anymore. We need to treat it with a little bit more respect. And we've just really scratched the surface because there's a whole uh, cadre of, of, of medications that are controlled substances. And then we have the over-the-counter medications. And we know that also the, the over-the-counter abuse in the United States is, is quite prevalent. Right, Dr. Clark? Well, we know that they're uh, common. Uh, we collect data. I think Tim can speak to the uh, specific data for the age range, particularly uh, our young people who abuse drugs uh, that contain uh, cough suppressants like dextromethorphan. There are a host of other drugs containing phenylpropylamine, diuretics, laxatives, uh, particularly young girls who are struggling with body image, drugs that cause uh, emesis, uh, throwing up. Uh, but the drugs that uh, contain dexamethorphan are used to uh, get a buzz on. They also, also, also contain alcohol at times, so kids take uh, uh, multiple doses instead of the therapeutic dose. Like prescription drugs, the over-the-counter drugs are safe and effective when used as indicated. Uh, but And also like prescription drugs, when misused, uh, you get a different effect, a different response. Tim. You know, the other uh, over-the-counter that we have actually haven't touched on here is inhalants, uh, which is a huge problem, and uh, especially in our younger grades. I mean, uh, our Monitoring the Future survey shows that it's kind of the reverse, uh, the 8th and 12th graders reverse. The 8th graders use more inhalants than the 12th graders do, and so that's some of the first and early exposure for these things that are readily available in the drugstore, uh, art store. Well, when we come back, I know that we've just scratched the surface on the over-the-counter because that, that is something that's even more accessible to the younger populations and they can just go up to the drugstore and, and acquire it. And so I want to talk about what some of the preventive uh, measures we can take, you know, not only parents can take, but pharmacies as well. 
We'll be right back. It's important to be familiar with the proper terminology surrounding addiction and recovery. One of the terms you want to be familiar with is substance use disorder. Substance use disorders involve the dependence on or abuse of alcohol and or drugs, including the non-medical use of prescription drugs. For more information on this and other recovery jargon, visit the Recovery Month website. Drug and alcohol addiction. You lose your way. But there is a way out. You can find direction, find support, treatment. Find yourself and your life, your direction home. For drug and alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. If someone you love has a problem with drugs and alcohol, isn't it expecting this? Yeah, but it's the right thing. There is something you can do. You think he'll be okay with this? Shh, here he comes. Congratulations! You can celebrate his recovery every chance you get. For drug and alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Today, we're a medicated society, and that means that prescription medicines and over-the-counter medicines are literally at arm's reach. In fact, people ages 65 and older, in, in any given year, are filling more than 30 different prescriptions. And one-third of older adults are using five different medicines at the same time. The mission of the National Council on Patient Information and Education, NICPI, is to stimulate and improve communication of information on safe and appropriate medicine use to the general public and healthcare professionals. Thank you for inviting uh, the National Council on Patient Information and Education, NICPI. That's how I'm going to refer to us today. One of our key programs right now is called the Teen Influencer Program. The, the full title is Maximizing Your Role as a Teen Influencer, What You Can Do to Prevent Teen Prescription Drug Abuse. That program enables adults in the community to access and download and then use for community outreach purposes a whole range of materials to help get the word out in a consistent way about prevention and treatment options related to teen prescription drug abuse. As medication use becomes more prevalent in our society for all ages, so too becomes the need to improve the communication about those medicines between the clinicians, the doctors, the pharmacists, other prescribers, and the patient, and their support network. SAMHSA has been a tremendous resource support to NICPI. They've provided resources and also the intellectual information and data that have enabled NICPI to develop resource materials such as our teen influencer program, materials that are available for the community and for teens and parents. NICPI makes sure that it embeds in all of its messages and materials information for the general public, for adults and teens about where they can seek out treatment information, including, for example, SAMHSA's hotline and their treatment locator. All the wonderful resources that we have, whether they're at AARP or the National Council on Patient Information and Education, all come down to helping people get the most value from their medicines. So if I go to a, uh, a gathering, it could be a party of one or it could be a party of a thousand, 
And people ask me what I do, and I tell them, automatically that triggers, oh, my mother's taking a lot of medications, or my son's having a problem with. So it creates an opportunity to, uh, to, to help and serve. So we've already established that over-the-counter medications are accessible and that youth are in particular risk of, of accessing these drugs. And what has been done or what can be done to help us deal with this problem? Beverly. We need to make sure parents are aware that this is really an issue and a concern for their youth and that we have community groups and schools and uh, different organizations bring that up because I think parents, it's kind of under their radar. They're looking for illicit drugs. They're kind of thinking about that and watching for their children, but they're not paying attention to the packages of cough syrup coming into the house or the, the different things they might find around or, or, or maybe uh, different um, shopping expeditions that you know, their children are taking to the drug stores. And they can work with their local community farmers too, to sort of increase that awareness and make people more aware that this is a prevalent issue and it is a problem. I, and I think it's getting on parents' radar will help a great deal in that respect. We want to keep parents aware that just because, again, it's on the aisle doesn't mean that if it's misused, it's safe. For instance, between 1999 and 2004, there's a seven-fold increase in overdose due to over-the-counter uh, cost medications. Uh, and most of those overdoses occur in the 15 to 16 year age range. So what we're talking about, we're talking about uh, the uh, young children and the family's uh, household. And when you ask uh, how much they took, it turns out that instead of taking uh, one or two tablespoons or tablespoons of medications, uh, our, our young people are taking 25 to 50 times the recommended therapeutic dose, which <laughs> is clearly not what the uh, ph uh, pharmaceutical company intended. So it's a, it's an important thing to keep in mind that uh, the age range that we're concerned about is everyone, but uh, particularly our young people when they take so much and they risk uh, complications, overdoses is a very real complication. And I think that we need to be very cognizant of the fact that the a parent speaking to their their teenager. Um, is is extremely impactful. Um, research states that the more um, understanding and education that the youth gets from the parent, the less likely that they're going to use the over-the-counter medications as, you know, thrill-seeking or, um, you know, get into trouble that way. So parent parental education and information to their teenagers is extremely important in prevention. Beverly, you wanted to ask something? Yes, I did. I want to. Um, I think we need to not stockpile our medications as well. So uh, parents can track how much cough syrup is in the house at any given time. You know, if, if you get to a point where the, the cold, the flu is gone, then throw that bottle away and then buy a new bottle when it comes in the next time. So that way they can track and, and kind of keep an eye on, on what the medication levels are there in the house. We, we teach our parents to uh, childproof their homes for toddlers, but we haven't really talked to them about doing the same types of things for, for their teens as well. Well, one of the things in terms of, of uh, if you can't, if you have to stockpile, keep the medication under lock and key. That's an alternative. Right. The reason I mention that because we also have to think about our rural citizens who have to travel long distances, sure. uh, and <laughs> that gets to be a problem. Or in communities like in uh, northern Alaska, where uh, everything has to be flown in. So if we you have to stockpile, you stockpile under lock and key, and you uh, keep the, uh, an eye on what's going on in that cabinet. That's great point. Or a family may simply not be able to afford. I mean, right. if they don't have a lot of money, I mean, you, you really wouldn't want to throw something out. But as Dr. Clark mentioned, you really need, and you did as well, you really do need to keep track of it. Dr. Condon? I think uh, Dr. Clark's point is right on. A medicine cabinet in 2009 has a different connotation than it did with my parents' generation. And back then it was where you kept this, the medicines that were very, you know, you mentioned the word we needed to respect them. But as the culture has changed with supplements and advertisements, and yes, we encourage people to get medications for their ailments, and we have many more life-saving medications available when appropriately. The medicine cabinet's no longer that 
sacred place where you store things. In fact, I would maintain um, personal observation. We don't even have a medicine cabinet. We have them all. We have medications uh, in drawers on counters, and I bet you most families, in fact, probably do the same thing. Yeah. That's correct. And talking about what we keep in the medicine cabinet, I'm, I'm intrigued about an off-camera conversation we were having related to medical marijuana, that some states are allowing medical marijuana to come in. And, and Dr. Condon, you wanted to make some observations. Well, again, we're talking about, we were talking earlier about um, prescription medications because they have the stamp of approval as safe and effective by the federal, uh, FDA. Uh, they are prescribed by a physician, These, and when used appropriately, they're life-saving, just as I said. Um, but that does impart to um, that medication that it's safe, and again, it's only safe for the individual. Um, but that's, that stamp of approval is, I think, contributing to our young people saying, well, it's safe for somebody else, or it's safe for my parents, it must be safe for me. And that's what we talked earlier about, that's not the right message. Uh, so the attitudes have been changing because uh, our Monitoring the Future uh, survey um, we released earlier this week is actually tracking those attitudes and we're finding a softening of attitudes about some prescription medications, the risks of, uh, of uh, harmfulness. Um, at the same time, we're seeing a softening of the attitudes about the, the perceived risk of marijuana and so there's a softening of that or a decrease in its perceived harmfulness and that may very well be uh, a result of we see uh, four, 13 states and one jurisdiction with medical marijuana laws uh, so if a physician's prescribing them how can that how can that be bad and how can one combat that danger what again I, I go back to the parent what does the parent say to the to the child it's still all about respecting medications and respecting the fact that a prescribed medication is safe for that particular individual, for that particular time, for that particular ailment. And then after that point in time, it's no longer safe anymore. So that's what we need to reinforce to the parents. And that message needs to come across um, all the way across the board. If we get that, that message out to parents, they will also understand that applies to the senior population, that applies to you know, our very young population. It's, it's the same message no matter what. We've talked a lot about the problem. I want to start now a little bit uh, diving into some of the solutions. And, and Dr. Krantz, particularly with the older Americans, um, and, and, and please note to let us know when one becomes older so that people can self-identify, <laughs> uh, because we are quite the young generation of older Americans that we're facing. I know I'll never start use, stop using genes or, or, or thinking that I'm, I'm older, for heaven's sakes, but I, indeed I am. And so I want you to address that, that issue. What, what do uh, the seniors uh, need to be uh, particularly cognizant of? And if they run into trouble, uh, what type of programs are available? Well, at, at, at Hanley Center, we have a prevention program called Aging to Perfection. And actually, our older adult unit, um, to answer your question, when you become old, um, is 55 and above. So I qualify for the older adult there program now. <laughs> um, but what our Aging Prevent to Perfection program actually addresses is um, helping the, the older adult, um, first of all, you know, simple things, write down the prescriptions that they're taking when they go to the doctor. Um, because again, they're getting multiple prescriptions from different physicians, and there are drug-drug interactions that potentially can be lethal to them. So writing them down, understanding, you know, asking questions, um, throwing away their medication when it's when they're finished, not saving it. And, and that's a hard thing in today's economy, you know, not saving the medication. So there's a list of prevention uh, uh, techniques um, that we teach the older adults so that they can use their medication in a more safe um, and effective manner. I want to uh, echo, echo that. I think um, we, for our uh, older uh, citizens, um, you know, their medications are oftentimes received uh, via the mail right. 
Mm -hmm. or they're standing in a long line in a retail pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So to ask questions is something that we just want to get out of it. And they, we really need to really get the message out that there is a, a, a professional there, a pharmacist. There's usually a little window where you can have a consultation, and they will take the time to talk to uh, individuals about drug interactions, about uh, doses, and let them understand rather than it just being a essentially a retail operation. Let me go to Dr. Clark and ask him as a physician, um, does the physician ha bear some responsibility to explain to their patients what they're getting and, and, and how to use it? Well, as Dr. Krantz would note, yes, the physician does, but again, in a, a period when uh, you've got multiple medications, sometimes for multiple practitioners, that's not as easily, that's more easily said than done. But one of the things you can do is you go to a single pharmacy and in the era of electronic records and electronic prescribing, uh, it's a lot easier for that single pharmacy to have their computer programs uh, acknowledge when there are potential uh, conflicts or adverse reactions. Uh, there are uh, delivery models like medical homes where uh, you've got one entity that is the repository of all your medical information. So if there is a red flag, that can be easily tracked. Uh, uh, when you get into the Medicare age range through e-prescribing, uh, again, there are, uh, it's a lot easier to track the records. So we're moving in the direction of having personal health uh, records and, and uh, electronic medical or electronic health records where the computers can play a role. But uh, as uh, Dr. Condon pointed out, uh, the senior themselves should understand with multiple medications, it's possible to have these conflicts, as Dr. Kranz pointed out, and you should ask. And if you ask, um, the pharmacist will take the time to discuss these matters with you. When we come back, I want to continue a little bit on this subject because I think there's a lot left unsaid still. We'll be right back. For more information on National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, events in your town, and how you can get involved, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. They tell me I was there, but I don't remember. I don't know where I really was. I do not know what I had for breakfast. I do not know who won the game. I don't recognize this man. If you or someone you know is struggling with a drug or alcohol problem, there is a solution. Recovery. Call 1-800-662-HELP for information and for hope. Through treatment, my life's a whole lot brighter now. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If I can do it, anybody can do it. I'm no exception. I happen to be a professional, but I was also an inmate. Upon studying for the bar exam, there was pressures um, as to your ability to concentrate and focus. I was dating someone whose father was um, a sports physician, and at their house were boxes of hydrocodone, sample boxes. And I did um, go to their house. I took two of the sample boxes that had 40 pills in them. My theory at the time, although yes, it was absolutely wrong to take pills out of someone's house that are not prescribed to me and do not belong to me, was after the bar exam, I will stop taking them. I did not think what if and what actually turned out to be my story. Being in recovery, we have the option to not only change our lives, but to change other people's lives. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't take the arrest off my record. I wouldn't do anything to change where I am today. And I think it's important to tell people the message that we do recover. I'm a five-time convicted felon. And today, and for the past over six years, I haven't taken a drug. And the message is we do recover. 
Dr. Clark, are there any types of monitoring systems that are instituted that one can um, look to uh, that help to solve this problem? Well, uh, there are different types of monitoring programs. One of the ones that we at the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration use and, and in conjunction with the Department of Justice are what's called prescription monitoring programs. And these are programs that monitor at the pharmacy level uh, the use of prescription opiates and other scheduled drugs and we're able to determine whether a physician is misprescribing or a patient is presenting in multiple systems if they use the same uh, uh, ID numbers so that we can uh, address that. But there are other prescription strategies and then Dr. Krantz was talking about one. Correct. Um, the one that has been helpful to me as a family practitioner is when I get the message from the pharmacy um, that did I realize that this particular patient was also taking this, this, and this drug. So that prescription monitoring program has been extremely helpful. The other thing I think we need to be mindful of with prescriptions, especially if we're talking about older adults, is that most of them can't read the directions on the prescription bottle. So again, speak as Dr. Condon had said, speaking with the pharmacist, speaking with their primary care physician is extremely important in understanding how to take the medication. And Dr. Condon, I mean, I think um, older Americans sometimes are afraid to ask, afraid to inquire. Uh, why should be, you know, I mean, let, let's emphasize again uh, the, the reasons why they should do this. Well, again, um, we know that uh, they're receiving more prescriptions than the last generation of uh, elderly adults in the United States. And uh, I think we even have a graph uh, showing the number of prescriptions on uh, how they've gone up in the United States. Um, we also know that most, most medications are tested in clinical trials not using older adults but using middle-aged people or younger uh, healthy individuals or uh, if there's a chronic illness, uh, not necessarily for children and not necessarily for seniors. And their metabolism, their pharmacokinetics, as we say, change dramatically uh, as we age and as we get uh, larger, as we put on weight, as we lose weight, uh, all of those factors. So um, yes, maybe seniors are reluctant to ask the pharmacist. I I think the pharmacists are a key here because um, in uh, just my personal experience in a retail pharmacy, actually one of the things that they really enjoy and it's one of the reasons they became pharmacists is to counsel patients and to let them and to share the knowledge that they have rather than just arguing with insurance companies over the phone. Mm -hmm. Beverly. Yes, in regard to our seniors again, I want to point out that as far as the pharmacist is concerned, we can go back to the pharmacists and ask questions later on. They are there for us to, to make use of and they enjoy doing that like you were, you were speaking of earlier. Uh, don't be afraid that once you've got your prescription and walk away that you can't come back the next day and ask questions of the pharmacist when you've looked at things a little bit more and looked at your other medications. And when it comes to our senior population, they have a lot of prescriptions, a lot of bottles lying around. We again want to encourage them to safeguard their medications because they may not be aware that maybe their grandchildren or friends of their grandchildren might come in and be shopping for medications or even some of the repair people coming in their homes uh, might be looking for medications. They might not be using them but they know they're valuable and they might be interested in, in taking those to, to resell later on. So it's all about safeguarding those medications and making people more aware. The pharmacist is there to help them store your medication safely, use them properly. You know, it, it's some very basic principles that we need to get the messages out about. We had spoken uh, earlier about some of the practices of people sharing their prescription, correct, Dr. Krantz? Uh, right. And uh, what, how do we feel about that? Well, prescriptions are not uh, written to be shared, first of all. I mean, it's extremely important to use your own prescription. And that's, I mean, we, Dr. Clark uh, talked about the statistics even of the teenagers, the youth, you know, uh, 12 to 25 that are using um, prescription drugs that are from a relative or a friend. I mean, it's a, it's a significant problem in the United States today. 
Beverly, talk to us about your programs. Sure. In Colorado, we started a new campaign called Rx Drugs Not Safe, Not Yours. Org is the, the website on that. And it's a resource for parents, students, educators. Uh, they can go there and find different connections to materials that patients can learn how to dispose of their medications properly. Uh, students can learn what to do if they think some of their friends are starting to have issues with drugs. Parents can go there to find other resources as well on how to address that issue within their home. The issue of getting help, we've talked about a lot about the what are the parameters of the problem, who are the targeted populations that, that, that are at risk, but if I've got a prescription misuse problem, Dr. Clark, uh, what types of uh, programs should I seek in terms of treatment? Well, you should uh, first, uh, we want to make sure that you're talking to your uh, practitioner. Uh, if you are reluctant to talk to your practitioner, SAMHSA has a 1-800-662-HELP, H-E-L-P, 1-800-662-H-E-L-P line. You can call that line and they will direct you to uh, a professional uh, evaluator who can uh, help uh, determine whether you need uh, an outpatient assessment or an inpatient assessment or, or what have you. But the key issue is the willingness to do that. One of the problems in our country is that most people don't perceive the need for assistance. Our data indicates that 95 percent of the people who meet criteria for abuse and dependence don't perceive a need. And, and, and Dr. Krantz was, was talking about that, especially with the prescription drugs. If you can start off with therapeutic use and if you're not careful, it creeps up and then you get embarrassed. If you're older or you, it's a lark if you're younger, nevertheless, it's the problem. So we encourage people to recognize that the misuse of prescription drugs is, is very dangerous uh, immediately to your health and potentially to other people. So you should uh, call 1-800-662-HELP. You should talk to your practitioner, or you can talk to someone uh, who is uh, medically sophisticated enough to assist you in finding the appropriate place. And as Dr. Clark was speaking, um, He's absolutely correct in the sense that one of the barriers to the treatment of this disease is the stigma, where where the people don't understand it as a disease. You know, uh, addiction is just as much a disease as diabetes, cancer, heart disease. We need to look at it that way. We need to have access to care and access to treatment um, because treating the disease um, changes the whole person's life. In your own case, Dr. Krantz, mm -hmm. what was your aha moment where you realized that you really needed help? My aha moment was when I thought I continued to have headaches, was taking the opioid, the uh, medication, and it, it wasn't getting better. And I came to the conclusion that probably maybe I'm crazy um, because I tried to stop stopped but couldn't stay stopped, didn't understand, was not, even in medical school, I was not given the education or the amount of education that I needed to understand that chemical dependency, addiction, um, is a disease and through the use and abuse of a, an addictive substance that the disease can kick in. So again, that barrier that I had to deal with was the shame and the guilt and the um, the stigma of being labeled a, a drug addict um, where I, I had no understanding. So when I walked into treatment, I thought, well, this is good because they'll give me a pill um, to help me because obviously I'm crazy. I'm doing things I would never do. I'm taking more medication. I'm a physician. I understand that I shouldn't be doing this. Um, and then they said to me, no, you have the disease of chemical dependency. And then through the education and understanding of that, I was able to get help and, and be in recovery since 1981. And I'm sure you're not the only one. I mean, there's a whole television show on HBO, uh, mm -hmm. Nurse Betty, uh, Dr. Clark, that we see her constantly taking uh, medication just to keep herself going because of all the stressors in life. Um, should people in the medical profession be particularly aware of, of these um, challenges? Well, I think the whole community, none of us is made out of steel and stone. Uh, medical professionals, because of their unique knowledge, whether it's a pharmacist or dentist or a physician, uh, can deceive themselves through their unique knowledge. 
Uh, and we've had some uh, terrible events where people with unique knowledge even recently have uh, uh, overdosed and died uh, or had uh, severe reactions. The key issue is that everyone should be aware that a, an addiction is a disease that can occur to anybody. It doesn't matter your social class, doesn't matter your information, how much knowledge you have. It is the misuse of the medication. And the first sign should be if I'm using the medication more often than it was prescribed or if I'm seeking out medication that was never prescribed for me in the first place. So for our young people, uh, well, we want to ha have fun and defining fun as the misuse of uh, prescription drugs or over-the-counter drugs. Uh, that's not a fun, that's Russian roulette. And so uh, we want to uh, encourage people to recognize that. Dr. Condon, final thoughts. Safe and effective medications <laughs> as prescribed for you. That's the message that we have to reinforce with the parents, the young people, and our healthcare professionals uh, so that they can reinforce it too. Beverly. Store your medications like you would your credit card, your social security number, your cash. Keep them safe and treat them as valuables. Dr. Franz. If you recognize that you're taking medications more frequently or in um, a, a higher for, or longer duration, um, that there is help out there for you. And Dr. Clark, final thoughts? Well, I think, again, the whole topic in terms of uh, uh, dealing with prescription drugs, whether it's opiates or tranquilizers, making sure we keep in mind uh, inhalants, because there are some therapeutic inhalants that uh, people use for uh, colds and other uh, situations. And then, of course, the topic of medical marijuana, uh, so that our kids don't start thinking that, oh, gee, if, I can, if a doctor prescribes it for chronic pain or a medical condition, I should run out and, and start uh, doing um, marijuana. It's an important message. Prescription drugs, as uh, Dr. Condon said, and as others, safe and effective when used as prescribed. And that is the phrase that we want to uh, promote. Um, thank you. Thank you. And we want to remind our audience that September is National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, a month where not only do we deal with wonderful events, but we also deal with some of the issues that we talked about today with the stigma associated with addiction and addiction treatment. So we want to encourage everyone to work up to that celebration by being cognizant of those around you that are in recovery, supporting them, supporting their families, and being very active during Recovery Month. I want to thank you for being here. It's been a wonderful show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning organizing and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it.